Um, this has been such an enjoyable afternoon. Um, all at once, um, I'm really happy to be moving into um, the final session of our afternoon because I'm so excited for the conversation that's about to unfold. Um, but simultaneously, um, uh, I hate to see this afternoon um, beginning to come towards its conclusion. Um, we're really delighted that you're each here. And the fourth session, or rather the third session of our afternoon, um, gives us an opportunity to speak a little bit further uh, with the musician, artist, and producer Buster Wolf, from whom we were very lucky to hear yesterday. Uh, as you know, and I'll just offer a few words of introduction, Buster Wolf now calls Tallahassee, Florida home. He is originally a native of Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Um, he, in Tallahassee, is a member of the Music Collective and independent record labor, label, Citronella Room. As you had a wonderful opportunity to hear last night, he has been um, deeply interested in the lyricism of Mina Loy's um, words and has done an amazing job translating uh, that interest into extraordinary music of his own. We are delighted that he will be joined this afternoon in conversation by another um, wonderful visual artist and music producer, Ross Cisneros, who works in the, field, the fields of sculpture, film, performance, and sound. His work has been shown at PS1, The Kitchen, CAC, Vilnius, and Artists Space. And finally, the third member of our conversation really needs no introduction, uh, but for the sake of the camera, I'm going to say a little bit. Uh, Roger Conover is well known here at Bowdoin. He is an alumnus, member of the class of 72. During his days at Bowdoin, he was a member of The Quill, the longest um, running um, publication among um, undergraduates, of, which continues, in fact, to be an important literary journal um, here at Bowdoin. I'm delighted that Roger, with typical generosity, is actually now in conversation with the current editors of The Quill. That work here at Bowdoin, I think, paved the way for a very extraordinary career, which I know has um, in many ways enriched the work that so many of us have had an opportunity to do in this room. Roger is executive editor emeritus of the MIT Press and Mina Loy's editor and literary executor. We are delighted that we have an opportunity to hear these three extraordinary interlocutors of Mina Loy's in conversation. Thank you for being together and I'll turn the floor over now to the three of you. Thank you, Anne. In a, a search to locate contemporary cultural activity and its sympathetic resonances with Mina Loy, Roger Conover began to discover musical threads that led back to Mina. And contemporaries like Thurston Moore of Sonic Youth, Billy Corgan of Smashing Pumpkins, and Argentinian songwriter Lou Glass, all, all a part of this unusual geneal genealogy of, of musicians who are acutely aware of Mina's gravitas and Buster Wolf is a part of that world. I'd like to reference uh, an artifact of correspondence that struck me. Uh, Nancy Cool showed us the words of William Carlos Williams in which he described Mina Loy's inheritance of a shoddy world. And this shoddy world and its relationship to disillusionment so central to the coping mechanisms that Dada offered and offers seemed to show some shared impetus within the genre of hip hop a genre that lyrically turns the tables, one that exposes relational and institutional distrust and hopes to reverse the shell game, signaling that perhaps it is time that the artists take advantage of the world and not the other way around. I find it fitting to share that the triangulation between Roger Buster Wolf and myself was experienced first, so I hear, by Buster Wolf as a hoax, a kind of scam, something so improbable that it had to be something among the common spam bot calls for collaboration in the disingenuous spaces of the internet. <laughs> True story. 
I thought about triangulation without centrality as often becoming the site where paranoic shell games begin. But as Mina Loy's centrality was fortified, the sincerity of our motivations became clearer and more importantly, trusted. We were then free to explore triangulation with centrality. There is a dimension of Mina's transmission that gives permission to misbehave, an, encouraging, an encouragement of a plot twist. And so we followed this lead, imagining a performance of Buster Wolf's work to be presented in an unlikely context. We can now move uh, to an unscripted conversation with Roger Conover and Buster Wolf uh, with reflections on that performance, on that misbehavior, the influence of Mina's work uh, on Buster Wolf's creative process, and open it up to conversation questions in the room. So thank you. So you came here from Florida a couple of days ago, first time in Maine, performed at a in an academic setting, in a first time in a museum, or no? First time rapping in a museum. Yeah. So yes. I just want to hear what it's like. <laughs> I want to hear. You know, we're gonna set a very different tone here than the previous part of the day. But just yeah, what was it, what's this experience been like for you? Like d doing those things. And um, wonderful, strange, uh, but not so dissimilar from anything that had done before. Um, you know, I've played sold out venues opening for KRS One, Hip Hop Legend, and I've played shows in kitchens and friends' houses, uh, punk shows where, you know, the floor was about to cave in because uh, I don't think you should have 100 people in a kitchen <laughs> at once in a house in Tallahassee that was built in like the 60s. But um, yeah, so it wasn't super different, you know, for me, where I am, like the, the my immediate surroundings, like don't, really affect my performance that much. Like it's, especially, I, I was telling you, you asked me if I was nervous yesterday, I was like, no. <laughs> like, I could do this in my sleep anywhere, like, you know. So, yeah, we're, it, it, but it's been a wonderful experience just being here and um, performing for folks that probably otherwise would never have heard my music. That has been incredible, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was really astonished when I came across your amino oil work and, I think the main reason that we invited you, as opposed to any of the other musicians that we were also in contact with, was because your work does discursively so engage with Mina Loy's lyrics in a very direct way. I mean, you're, she's recognizable in the vocabulary of your pieces, even though you you twist and you morph and you and you play and you adapt. It's still it's very much Mina Loy's voice is, is still intact there. But the thing I wanted to know first, because I was just curious, like how you know how the hell did you find Mina Loy? Like what like how does this happen between hip hop and and Mina Loy writing? songs, poems, 100 years ago or more that you're, that you're now appropriating into your work. And yeah, just, I mean, I know from conversation yesterday, but share yeah. that, that what, how, you know, how and why I mean a lot. Sure. Um, I was handed a copy of Lunar Baedeker when I was in college and it just kind of changed everything. Before I started doing hip hop, I was doing spoken word poetry and, um, when I was reading it, I, that's how I read it in my mind as though it were, you know, being performed by a spoken word because it just felt like lyrics to me. It also felt obviously like this has been a theme too, but it felt like it was from the future. Um, it felt like someone not of this planet wrote it. And I assumed initially upon reading it that she must have been a contemporary of like the beat writers, something like that. And um, when I found out how long ago she was writing, my, my head exploded. And I was just like, this is awesome. Um, but I didn't really do a deep dive until a couple years later. At that point, I was doing Buster Wolf. I was producing. And um, uh, I had uh, taken courses on um, Gertrude Stein. And that kind of got me back into all those uh, avant-garde uh, artists of that time. So I was like, yeah, let me, let me follow up on Mina Loy. I ordered a copy of the book that you, in fact, edited way before I even knew who you were. And um, 
I immediately opened up to Lunar Baedeker because that was the first one I read. I just wanted to experience that again. And um, I got hit with the same feeling the second time. And I was like, I'm not the type of person that's going to sit there and write a song about somebody. Like I think how um, the songs that uh, you mentioned earlier were more so like, these are songs like odes to her about her, how she, you know, for me, I wanted to do the hip hop thing, which was to remix it. So being being a producer and I started as a visual artist and I really enjoyed doing collages. And like when you are a hip hop producer, a lot of the times what you're doing is like an audio collage. And so I kind of just took that idea and I was like, I'm going to remix this language and put it, you know, in the context of one of my songs. And really the first thing that, that did it was just the word Stelectric. And I remember seeing that and being like, that don't mean shit. Like that is not a word that is not in the dictionary. And I was like, but I like that. I'm stealing that. And at first I was like, I'm just going to use the word Stelectric. And then it was like, you know what? Now nah, let's flip this whole thing. And, um, also at the time, a lot of rappers would, would say like, you know, I'm rap game this, I'm rap game that. And I was like, I'll bet, I'll bet you one nobody's going to say is Mina Loy. So I'm rap game Mina Loy. And um, that's kind of how that song came to be um, from my experience of uh, engaging with her work. I didn't even know she was a, a visual artist until we came in contact with each other. Yeah. Um, can we go back to the the hoax? And I want to frame it within, um, yeah, maybe talking a bit about the far-fetched. And maybe by talking about the far-fetched, we talk about hybridity, which I think is, you know, within Mina Loy's um, uh, work. And as you said yourself, you weren't even aware that she was a visual artist. Mm -hmm. But there must have been something that seemed far-fetched about the our outreach and um yeah just walk us through the the incomprehensible <laughs> yeah you're well, talking about like a month ago right just right recently like, yeah right yeah was anyone at the performance yesterday did all y'all see that okay i was thinking i could like do an acapella of mina loy just so <laughs> they can have an idea of what we're talking about right right Stop that. You'll miss the song. Dance with a somnambulous, soliloquy, spin free. I got a little sweet and subtle, numbing me simply. I grip mics tight when I'm brandishing those. We'll stay lit with the chandelier souls. Go get that spit champion pros. Bear witness to the fact that we dope. Regicide for cats that sat on the throne. I don't fit with the pros, so I'm lamping alone. I got ground swell, I shine like star shell. The force of my flow is Artesia well. Of course, I could blow through a whole citadel on a midnight train, Zodiac carousels. Comparisons are odious. There ain't nobody close to this, homie. This music cornucopia is copious. Incontrovertible Porter Rock B-boys to electric when I spit leave blocks destroyed. Unclear context be the mode I employ. It's the same complex as the ghosts in the droid. Paranoid toys, no stranger to the void. Zodiac carousels, rap game mean alloy. That's verse five. <laughs> verse, I, I can do the second one. The second verse is a... Uh, your language isn't livery, your damage, your vicinity, literally hitting these cats with wicked imagery. Wolf is the epitome of wounding minds critically. Critics don't, Critics don't interest me, never mind the industry. Listen, B, this is the entrance to infinity. Mannequins masquerade and manifest through mysteries. I take aim, take stage, my page, make flame, old age, so strange, displayed. Okay, I used to hop trains, overlook the city snaking through those veins. Panoramic visions are vivid and so gray. Automatic prison, I'm living in soul days. Lunatics moved it as soon as the groove plays. And Lindy hop with Lucifer and pale moon rays. I catalyst, leave you lost inside a labyrinth. Master this tongue be the dagger that I'm stabbing with. I speak off beat, leave your metronome home. Freaks taught me only, only speak what I know. I must not sleep, must make beats for poems. Infect deep by the streets that he roamed. Unclear context is the mode I employ. It's the same context as the ghost in the droid. Paranoid toys, no stranger to the void. Asteroid impact, rap game, mean alloy. Wow. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to gas myself up or anything. I just felt like I needed to provide context to the people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, yes. <laughs> Very smart. Yeah. So the hoax. Yeah. Well, when you are an independent rap 
artist and producer and you have a lot of output, you get a lot of um, people asking you to send them beats or to collaborate on a song and this, that, and the other, or, or hey, we can add you to our playlist on Spotify, you'll get 8,000 listens in one day. And it's like, you just learn to filter that stuff out. Um, so yeah, I got that. And initially, I think you guys hit up my, my label mate, buddy, and he told you guys to contact me directly. He didn't tell me, so I didn't have my friend like my friend did not vouch for y'all. <laughs> like I had this, it just came in and I was like, and then you were like, I'm at Roger Conover's desk. And I'm like, who the hell is Roger Conover? <laughs> and then I go and grab my book and I'm like, executor of me to Louis State. I'm like, oh shit. I was like, yeah, what's up? Yeah, that's me. I wrote that song. Why? What do you want to know? And um, yeah, and then from there, uh, you know, it was just gonna be being mentioned in the talk, which I thought was awesome, period. And then from there, it just kind of went that we were lucky enough to go ahead and set it up where I was able to come here and do the show and then be here. Thanks, man. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, actually. Well, it's, well I think it's, it's evidence that the, you know, these two worlds can coexist, mm -hmm. as unlikely as it may seem. And, uh, and yeah, we thank you for that trust and as I mentioned, I think Mina Loy provided that centrality that created a, a trusted triangulation. When you found her, did you know that you were going for something far-fetched, that you were reaching outside of the usual vocabulary and nomenclature of hip-hop, that you're actually going into yeah, I mean, yeah, it? Yeah, I do that anyway. Yeah. So, you know, when I saw her work, I was like, get out of here, you was doing this back then? And, uh, you know, uh, I, I like a lot of uh, creators and I don't know, I just feel like I'm an alien. I, I feel like a lot of what I do doesn't, I mean, I've, I've played in punk bands, I've done other things because sometimes I feel like, uh, you know, I don't want to be limited to one genre or anything like that. But um, yeah, I always kind of go for something far-fetched, I think. Um, Did you identify with her as also a sort of fellow outlier? Outcast? Yeah, totally, she's a freak. Alien. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she realized, and I think she said in like the modern poetry, uh, uh, something along the lines that, uh, you know, in, in cities and rural areas in America, like there's this, this you know, basically I, to me, it felt like she was talking about slang. She says, no one, there's this, there's in, in American language, in these uh, urban centers, there's this sense to not want to say things the way anyone else has already said them. And I was like, you damn right. Like that, that just resonated with me. And um, that's what I try to do, not just in my music, but like in any art that I do is like, and I think, you know, so for me, I wasn't trying to come too wacky with it, but when I saw that she was making up her own words or even combining words and, and, and just being so free with language in that way, um, for somebody who grew up in a multilingual household and, and feeling like I neither language was like my actual language. I felt like when I really started doing my music and writing lyrics and stuff like that was, okay, that's how I was meant to really, really express myself. And in this way, I can say things the way no one else can. So I saw that in her for sure. Yeah, you're very close to her in that. In that yeah, yeah. And, and you have to, I felt like a, a degree of, of uh, integrity in in um, one of the lyrics, which you just performed, um, I may be getting it wrong, but ignoring the critics, or what, yeah. what's that line? Critics don't interest me, never mind the industry, yeah. Okay, so can you speak more about that? Because I think that's also a through line with Mina Loy. Yeah, to your point yesterday, I had a song in which I say, um, maniacal minority, their vocal steady boring me, I do this for myself, I don't need anyone adoring me. And, that is like kind of if there's a, a theme throughout my music at all, it's that because first and foremost, it's, you know, we were talking yesterday at dinner about like artists creating their own world because the world is untenable. And I think in hip hop, especially, which is like this art form that came out of poverty, abject poverty in a time when like the Bronx was literally on fire and uh, you know, there was just a lot of problems in New York at that time. And, um, you know, rather than everyone resorting to, you know, there was a lot of violence, but 
hip hop was born to, 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 to counteract that violence and to, to, you know, instead of people shooting each other in the streets, we were having breakdance battles, DJ battles, you know, that's where these block parties were happening. That's where hip hop was born because it was a way of managing an untenable world and creating their own language and ways in which to communicate and battle each other if they have to, but without doing it the way the world expects them to, but in this awesome, beautiful, creative, musical way. So. Great answer. Yeah, maybe that's so vivid. Yeah. I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> Out there? I'll lead off. Oh, thanks, Amanda. Sorry, I, we should all speak into this um, mic because the camera will pick it up. Um, so, Buster Wolf, thank you so much for being part of this discussion. And it's really remarkable to me your um, ability to cite with such uh, acuity um, the language that is employed um, in the songs that you've written. And thank you for performing um, Mina Loy for us a cappella. That was great. Um, one of the things that I'm very struck by um, in your description of um, the emergence of hip hop out of um, a sense of crisis, um, talking about the sense of neighborhoods being on fire, um, those remarks resonate with um, an aspect of Loy's poetry and visual art um, that we've sort of discussed in a couple of different contexts um, this afternoon. And that is, um, and I'm gonna quote Ann Louder back here, but the relationship between the beautiful and the unbeautiful. And this notion of the relationship between control and lack of control, um, neatness and untidiness, um, which is another word that came up. And I wondered if you might be able to speak a little bit about the way in which you as a musician, as an artist, um, negotiate those tensions, the way in which you perhaps see the art form of hip hop itself negotiating those tensions, um, and whether or not that's an aspect of Loy's work specifically um, that you found appealing and resonant. Yeah, definitely. Um, when it was being discussed uh, earlier, and I heard it, uh, because I, my brain always goes to hip hop lyrics, um, I thought of there's this group called Rat King, and there's a rapper named Wiki from New York, and he's incredible. And there's a song, I can't remember the name of it, but he's talking about his journal, and he goes, says something like, my journal's dotted with the prettiest, po the prettiest prose mixed with the gritty and gross. And I think that that is just hip hop to a T. Um, it is the prettiest prose mixed with the gritty and gross. Um, nowadays, I mean, it's it's there's hip hop songs about anything, and and you know there's a there's a lot of wealthy hip hop artists, so they're not all you know addressing these things. But I think that that spirit definitely still lives there. If you listen to artists, and I always tell people to listen to Billy Woods and Elucid because I think they are great examples of kind of navigating um, both those things. I mean, they get to travel the world, and you know they'll have these like really long, beautiful, just um, almost like travel log. Uh, uh, kind of uh, songs. Billy Woods has a, uh, an entire album he just put out called Maps, and it's about, you know, on his travels. And in the same breath where he will be describing, um, you know, uh, pushing his daughter on the swing and how, you know, how much that means to him, that beautiful moment, he'll have all these songs about, you know, he, he grew up in, in really uh, difficult settings as well. So, you know, he'll go back to his childhood, he'll go back and talk, talk about how things were, um, the tension between his parents growing up and this is all you know all in in his uh on one record you know even in one song he can jump from one to the next and i would argue that the best hip-hop artists will do that in one line jump from the gr prettiest prose to the gritty and gross in one line um so you know it, it might not be as uh easel, easily noticed in what some would call commercial hip hop. A lot of the things you would see on like an MTV or just the, you know, top selling artists and things like that, because that kind of stuff never sells. Um, everybody wants to party and dance and not think about the gritty and gross. But I think the best hip hop artists um, are still engaging in that dichotomy for sure. Thank yeah. you so much. I hope that answers the question. It was a beautiful response. Thank you.
I have a question about, um, and it's maybe a little abstract, but how, how your, um, your lyrics and performance live in the body. We've been talking a lot today about Mina Loy's representations of hands and faces and her work to the body. And of course, we can't ask her directly. Um, Mina Loy, how does your work live in your body? But particularly the memorization um, is so one way I think of um, what you do different from um, page poetry and what I do. Maybe the only difference, I don't memorize my work um, and maybe I probably perform it less beautifully. I surely perform it less beautifully. But um, that's a huge difference. Your poems live in your body in a way that seems really extraordinary. So I wonder if you could just talk about that experience and that process. Yeah, I jokingly, I jokingly tell my friends that um, whenever I get to lose in my mind, uh, when I'm older, to just go ahead and play my, my beats for me because I'll be able, I'll come right back and, you know, <laughs> just snap right out of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, memorization is big. Um, I didn't realize how much of it lived in my body really. Uh, well, I guess I did, but I was really thinking about it because yesterday after I performed, um, so I can't remember who, sorry, I had a lot of discussions yesterday, but somebody did mention um, a gesture or something that I did on stage and I was thinking and I was like, that's really funny because I was, I do get a little bit, uh, I do move around a lot on stage. Uh, I was trying specifically not to, because I was like, oh, these people think I'm crazy. <laughs> I don't want to threaten anybody. But um, yeah, there's a, it's, it's, it's super performative. Like once you, I would, I would challenge you to go ahead and start memorizing some of your poems, because I promise you, you'll start rehearse, you'll start like, you'll start uh, performing them in ways that might surprise yourself once you have it memorized. Because well, yeah, yeah. Exactly. in your case, how much is memorization? How much is improvisation? Like, is it is it different? I improvise yeah. when I need to. Uh -huh. It's not something. I mean, I can improvise. I think uh, a lot, all the best rappers can improvise. A big part of coming up in the rap game is being able to freestyle. But for me, I'm not up there trying to show you how great I can freestyle. Like, I'm trying to really present things that I've worked on, like intentionally, um, things that I specifically chose to put in a set list and share with people in that moment. So, I mean, I will definitely, you know, I think I was trying to. Uh, censor myself a little bit because it was just cute child in the audience and I, I didn't want to scare them with F-bombs. Yeah. So I noticed every time I did that, I would kind of stumble and would have to recover. So there was like this improvisation there, but no, like what I just did with Mina Loy, that's absolutely memorized. And like, you know, there's songs where I memorize, like there's this, I hate to keep like, I have a line that where I say this thing, but uh, yeah, I have this song, where I say, you know, I bet they didn't know the Buster Wolf was a geologist. I mastered the science of breaking new ground and rocking it. And every time I do that, I go, I rock at it. Like, I can't not do it. And I didn't do it the first time I recorded it. I wasn't in the studio like, yeah, you know, but I've done that song a million times. And like that just over time became a thing. And, you know, you find yourself not wanting to perform things exactly the same way every time. Or you might... You might have ran into somebody, you feel differently in a song might, you know, you might recite it, you know, differently or perform it differently. But um, yeah, I would say you should definitely try to memorize a couple of your favorites, maybe even the longer, more difficult ones, um, because it might surprise you. Um, you. You know, a lot of times I close my eyes too when I'm on stage. You probably saw me close my eyes when I was reciting that, well, you know, I feel like I am going somewhere within myself physically to like unfurl the scroll, you know what I mean? And read from it and, and yeah. So it, it, yeah, it's, it's crazy. At this point I've done it so many times. Like, it's just like, it's just like my body just, I, I'm barely there sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Great question. Thank you. So hello, uh, in my field of uh, classical music, one of the things we get very excited about is being able to follow the sketchbooks of a composer mm -hmm. to see how he or she may have come to the final product. Uh, and in some cases, unfortunately, some composers were so critical of themselves, they destroyed their so-called musical journals, if you will. Uh, so the question is on two sides, one to the Mina Loy scholars in the room, 
Do we know anything about her creative process in terms of how she came to her final poems or final essays or writings? Is there any, um, you know, diaries, journals, or sketchbooks, we call them in music? And then to what degree is your creative process sort of immediate? Do you freestyle for a while? You find combinations of words, write them down, or is the creative process on paper, you're writing it, you're seeing it, you're hearing it, and then you adjust. So maybe the Mina Loy scholars first, what was her, was there, is, do we know anything about her creative process? And then, possibly. Well, I, I think Sarah can probably talk about this really beautifully um, it, because it's, it's fascinating and complicated and she's done so much editorial work as well as this two volumes. So why don't you start and then? I mean, a part of what I edited were rough drafts that have been left in their extant condition. So there, there's certainly a lot of rough work in, in the Yale archive. Um, and she does, you know, she does redact, she does rephrase. She doesn't, there's not a lot, I would say, in the Yale archive of her writing out whole tracks a second time. Like that, that is the kind of work I think that actually you are doing, um, which is the, the more, the longer pieces that we see multiple drafts of. Um, but there is a lot of evidence of how she thinks and, and writes. Lots of wonderful things, you know, like her spelling errors, her, you know, her struggle. I think this is so important for us all to remember because we always so often see a finished product and everything's so beautiful and pristine and clean on the page. Um, and it's really important to remember that the actual kind of visceral struggle of writing which you get from, from the archival work. Yeah, I would agree. The manuscripts I've worked on, there are more. There are a lot more drafts of, um, and so you can see her processing and reprocessing, but things don't feel finished. And one thing leads to another thing, and even phrases like the covered ent entrance to infinity, the blind back. So these things that would come up in these manuscripts, and then I have both the um, paper copies and the digital copies of the Lunar Banneker and the stories in the essay. So I would Google phrases just to see if they come up. And that's just a pure play. Um, so it's not, it's not a, a span from um, rough idea to finished piece, really. It feels much more organic. Although certainly there are, you know, finished pieces. There were published poems. Um, the, the drafts that I worked off most of, they are, um, they are typed um, copies with hand corrections that indicate editorial polishing. So there she's swapping out words, she's rephrasing. So that feels um, absolutely more finished than, of course, the handwritten draft usually. Um, and, and Nancy's been a great um, interlocutor in this process because you're always quick to remind me um, in, in my mind that um, you can't really know what the order of things are. I mean, sure, you can trace changes, but she might have changed it back to something that was, you know, in the beginning. So, except um, when you can, except you know, when you can, or yeah, when you can. Oh, yeah. No, I would just add that that's that with an archive that's assembled in the way that me, that Mina Lois is. We were talking about it earlier today. Um, it is. Uh, it's evidence of the messiness of the creative process, the forward and back of it, the um, the kind of circular qualities it can have, um, and then we end up we end up finding trying to date things um, with different pieces of evidence, trying to relate, you know, figure out what the relationship between this page and that page because they both have pin marks in them are like those kinds of mm -hmm. things um, end up being you know forensic evidence that scholars spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, but they're, they're not always present, you know. But there's, there's some funny moments in the drafts as well. Like she's a real word counter. She counts her words a lot of the time, right? And also, I, one of the things that really strikes me about these later novels is there are fictionalized accounts of her life, but at the same time, there will be marginal notes where she talks about, when she talks about bumping into a woman who works in the sex trade in the street in London um, as a teenager, and this was a defining moment for her. It's like, I feel total empathy for this woman I'm supposed to abhor and revile, but I don't. I feel empathy toward her. And then in the margin she writes, was it 5.30 p.m. That, I, that that happened, right? So there's this kind of fidelity to a, re, a real past that she wants. So these marginal notes are so fantastic. Right? I'm fictionalizing this account, but I also want it to be situated in something that's accurate and real at the same time. So there's this kind of struggle that you can see in her own writing. I don't know, I was wondering if you had any thoughts. Um, well, not 
Um, again, we don't know enough about Mina's creative process because we have very few of um, things in in process, like the sort of thinking part. So the, the suite of drawings that's upstairs is one of the few places in which we can see that she was obviously looking and quickly recording. And so we can determine some of what she thought was of value in terms of those observations. But a lot of the process material in terms of how she got to our work doesn't exist. The only other things they have is that the Beinecke, um, in the late work, uh, she used, she created numerous hands and faces that are in a portfolio with the Beinecke. So she obviously was switching them in and out, like a, a, a vocabulary of images in compositions. So those are, again, that's one of the other few things we know about besides some other sketches that are at the Beinecke, you know, that are quick, but, but we don't have enough of that material, so. I don't even really remember what the question was. <laughs> uh, right, uh, I write and I make beats and I have this ability to by feel alone, just, you know, I always write as whether or not it's with the intent of it being in a song. So, and whenever I do beats, it's in batches. So I'll usually do like five to 10 in a sitting. And um, it's usually when I'm doing those and work, working on those and finalizing them that I'm like, because I memorize my lyrics so quickly that I'm like, I can already hear it playing, the completed song. So yeah, a lot of times I'll grab the mic right there and record it right there. And that's the version that I'm putting out. Like I, I don't like to change it from that version. Um, that's the initial recorded version. If I wanna change it and play with it later on live, I could. But yeah, usually a lot of, a lot of uh, everything I have online streaming and everything is basically demos. I don't like to change stuff once I put it down. Um, but they're very separate. Writing is just something I just do all the time compulsively, but beats, I kind of really need to be in like a, a special place for that. Um, and yeah, so I, I seldom do those at the same time. I seldom write to my beats. Um, I did write to Mina Loy. Um, that was like just a magical song uh, that came together like that, but I don't typically work that way, yeah. I'm not classically trained in anything, so I, I'm very f feel based. You know, I just go with the, my gut a lot. Yeah. yeah.